We could negotiate a public option of some sort right. uh, that I might look at, but I don't want a big government Washington run uh, operation that would undermine the 200, the insurance that, uh, private insurance that 200 million Americans now have. Hope Harry, Harry Reid enjoyed that number 60 this weekend. Sounds like he's back down to 56. And he gets to do it all over again. That's the good news. Top line starts right now. Hello and welcome to ABCNews.com's Top Line. I'm David Chalian. And I'm Rick Klein. Each weekday we're bringing you the very latest political headlines, reporting, insight, analysis, everything you need and want to know about politics. And to keep the conversation going all day long, it's Twitter.com slash The Note. Let us know what you think. Twitter was lighting up this weekend with the Senate vote. Uh, it was. Uh, it get was. Us started. It, it, was, it was indeed a big day. Getting to 60 again. They did get 60 on Saturday in the Senate, but now Harry Reid has to build the coalition together all over again. We have big divisions on the public option, on abortion, on taxes, on how to get all these folks back together in one place. There are so many lines being drawn in the sand, David, that it's hard to imagine the scenario that gets them back to 60 after Saturday's vote. And those are all the lines being drawn among Democrats, but you're going to have Republicans that are going to introduce amendment after amendment to put Democrats in a tough position on these votes. And there's just still a wide gulf between the House and the Senate versions of these bills. A brewing civil war. You think health care is tough? How about Afghanistan? We have David Obi, chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, telling our John Carl in an exclusive interview that the cost of this war is something the White House better start considering, because if they spend all their money uh, on the Afghanistan surge, Rick, there will be no money, he says, for other domestic priorities. This comes on the heels of Nancy Pelosi calling Hamid Karzai an unworthy partner, and it comes... Uh, on the heels of Carl Levin, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, saying a war tax on the wealthy might be needed to pay for this. Uh, this is a much greater potential to divide the Democratic Party than health care. It makes it hard to imagine that, that, that President Obama could endorse the full McChrystal uh, report and those recommendations, given the pushback that's happening in the Democratic Party already. We're seeing another meeting scheduled for tonight, a ninth meeting of the War Council. We thought no, eight was it. <laughs> now we've got a ninth. Ensign's accuser, Doug Hampton, is out with new explosive allegations about uh, his, re his relationship uh, in, with, with former senator, or current senator, I should say, John Ensign. He has an interview with Cynthia McFadden on Nightline tonight uh, where he says, uh, among other things, that uh, John Ensign helped set him up in a lobbying career, which would itself be a broken, uh, a breaking of the ethics laws uh, in Congress. In addition to that, there's new problems, I think, for Senator Tom Coburn, because the allegation from Doug Hampton here is that Senator Coburn was the, the middleman in offering a million-dollar-plus set Settlement, saying, look, what, we can make this all go away if you take a million dollars from, from the ensigns. And, uh, of course, Coburn saying that's not the case. George asked him about it yesterday on this weekend, and he said that was clearly not the case at all. Perhaps your former slip was, uh, your, it was a Freudian slip there <laughs> to say former senator. After this interview hits, uh, it'll be interesting to see John Ensign uh, reassess his political standing. And retirement watch. We got news today that a Democrat in Kansas's third congressional district, Dennis Moore, uh, has been in Congress for a decade, is, has announced his retirement. This is the first Democratic House retirement purely, and we haven't heard his reasons yet, uh, simply to retire from Congress. The other seven vacancies have been people seeking other office, governor or senator, but this is going to be what we need to watch for the next month or so, folks. The political environment is shaping up to be very rough for Democrats in 2010, and if this is just the beginning, and this guy is sitting in a district that Obama won by 51 percent, Rick, what about those 49 members that are sitting in McCain district? That's exactly it. This is the most important metric that's going to happen right now as 2010 landscape happens. How many retirements do we see like this? No doubt. We are going to begin with a guest all the way across the pond. We're joined by journalist and documentary filmmaker Andy Worthington, who has a film out on Guantanamo Bay and the, and the prison camp there uh, for terrorist detainees. Uh, Mr. Worthington, thank you so much for joining us from our London Bureau. We appreciate it. It's very good to be here. Thanks. Sure. I, I want to begin uh, because Guantanamo, you, you've been there and done your work there. Uh, it has been back in the news uh, because of the recent decision uh, from the administration and from Eric Holder that uh, several of these detainees are going to be uh, tr transported to New York to be in a civilian court to go on trial. I is that something that you think these detainees were expecting all along? Well, I think um, for many years they probably thought that nothing resembling justice was going to be delivered to them because the whole project had been established by the Bush administration to hold people, you know, potentially forever without charge or trial. So, you know, I think it's a great thing that the people who are genuinely accused of these terrible atrocities are actually going to face justice in a federal court. 
Um, I'm slightly less happy that the military commissions have been revived as what appears to be a second tier justice system for people that the administration perhaps thinks it has less evidence against. Uh, Andy, your, your new documentary is based on interviews, extensive interviews you have with, uh, with people who were detained at Guantanamo. Let's take a, a look at that and we're going to ask about it uh, after we play this clip. The gator said to us, you will be released one day, yes. You will be released, I'll tell you that, you will be released, but you will not be released from this place until you are broken wrecks. We will release you, you are terrorists. And we will release you, yes, but you will be physically finished psychologically finished, and you will be nothing. It sounds like a version of, of psychological torture that happens to these detainees about the issue of being released. And we're still talking about right now, and I, I wonder what, what this says about the, the fact that there's so many detainees there that we don't have a plan for right now. Well, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's a problem. I mean, I think, you know, I think the Obama administration has been reviewing the cases all year and has found it difficult to make decisions, uh, you know, really, because... In a lot of cases, there's very little evidence against them. And the, what evidence there is in a lot of cases is actually hearsay, is what, is, is what other prisoners have come up with, quite often under circumstances of, of duress or other prisoners who've been bribed. I mean, actually, the best way forward is what's been happening in the uh, district courts, where the judges there have been looking at the habeas corpus petitions of these prisoners. And over the last 13 months, have reviewed 39 cases, and in 31 of those, have said to the government, you know, your evidence doesn't stand up. These guys are not connected with al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Let them go. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, you know, the Obama administration has been obstructing the progress of, of these cases because it's clearly the best way is to allow the judges to, to look at the evidence or the lack of it. Andy, uh, when you were there, I want to get your sense of what the facility was like. And, and you're, obviously, we heard from that prisoner you just interviewed uh, about some of the treatment from the officials there. But uh, Democrat and Republicans alike come back from visits to Gitmo and sort of praise the facility overall as a top-notch facility. H how did you find it? Well, you know, I mean, visitors to Guantanamo are not allowed direct access to the prisoners. And... Um, however well it appears to be run, and it, it may well be that it, that, it, um, that it all looks fine on the surface. But I think the thing that everybody needs to understand about this prison is that it may look like prisons on the U.S. mainland. In fact, it, its blocks are modeled on, on maximum security prisons on the U.S. mainland. But these are men who have never been charged, have never been tried. They haven't been convicted. They never went before a judge. Every day they wake up wondering when, if ever, they will be released. And this is still the same outcome of what the Bush administration set up, that it decided not to hold people as enemy prisoners of war or as criminals, but as this novel category of human being who really had no rights and could be held indefinitely, which is an extraordinary um, mental anguish that that causes the people, I believe. Uh, briefly, Andy, does it matter that the Obama administration is now saying that they will not meet their deadline of, of closing Gitmo within a year? I think it's quite important, actually, yeah, because I think what's happened over the year, we've seen this revolt in Congress, particularly I think Republicans have seized on the issue as what they think is a win-win issue, reviving Dick Cheney's talk about the terrorists as though they all are. And, you know, the problem now is that the only people that he's allowed to bring to the U.S. mainland are people who will face a trial. So what happens to all these cleared prisoners, many of whom have no countries to go to because they fear the risk of torture if they're returned? What happens to these other prisoners who are in this kind of nebulous area where the government thinks that it, that it should be worried about them but doesn't have enough evidence against them? I don't know what's going to happen to these guys. It seems that without some effort to set a new deadline and to put pressure on Congress, they could be languishing in Guantanamo for years, and we Andy. could be having this same conversation a year from now. Andy Worthington, journalist and the documentary filmmaker of Outside the Law Stories from Guantanamo, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.